Good morning. Good morning. That was pretty good on a Sunday morning. We'll try it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We are here to worship. We are here to celebrate. And I have three young people who are going to come forward. And uh, they're going to join with me up here. Our opening song this morning is Sanctuary 655. So if you please turn there and stand with us as we sing together Sanctuary. Thank you. Lord, this morning, as we worship, may it be in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I have a number of quick announcements this morning before we uh, move to our ministry moment. Um, this week I received a number of telephone calls, and one was even early this morning while I was here. Uh, is church canceled? Do we have church this Sunday? And right now, as many people know, that there is the beginning, it seems, of the second wave, they're saying, of the coronavirus. Yeah. 
And as of this morning, um, I was listening again to uh, the governor, uh, and the governor outlined three specific areas in which he is pulling back a little bit to try to close the valve, as he says, so that the coronavirus doesn't spread. He talked about bars and restaurants, and then after 10 o'clock, they need to be closed uh, because late at night, uh, people are not abiding by social distancing and wearing their masks, and he felt that by doing that, it would slow down the transmission. That is one of the places where they can track the transmission is happening. Gymnasiums, same thing. They've been able to track that transmission is happening in gymnasiums. And so he wants to pull back from that. And many of you have probably heard that it's pre-Thanksgiving and he has said no more than 10 people in a residence, no more than 10 people in a house, unless your household has more than 10 people automatically. But don't invite more than 10 people to your home because that is another place that they have seen people being less diligent about social distancing and the transmission is starting to take off. Well, why am I bringing this up? We as a church are called by God to be the best citizens that we can possibly be. Our first and foremost obligation is to the kingdom of heaven. Our first and foremost obligation is to be obedient to God's word, above the Constitution even. But God calls us in his word to be the best citizens that we can possibly be. And what that would mean in a practical way here at church is that we maintain our diligence in being cautious. That when we come, we sanitize our hands. And when we leave, we sanitize our hands. When we come, we wear a mask, and when we leave, we wear a mask. When the offering is being uh, received, or if communion is being distributed, that we put the masks back on, that we are conscious about our own health. And if we don't feel the best, well, then we don't go to church that day. Now, I know that not only for me, but for each of the elders in our church, that breaks our heart. When I was younger, I had to have like a really bad fever in order not to go to church. If I said, Mom, I don't feel good. I don't want to go to church today. She was like, get dressed. Get dressed. You're going to church. Well, we are in a different time. We're in a different world right now. So if you don't feel well, if you think something's wrong, we understand. God understands. Stay home. We will miss you. We love you. But at the same time, being diligent. And so it is appropriate for us as a church to be reminded that right now we need to be the best citizens that we can possibly be. If around the state, 5, 10, 15, 20 churches became the hot spots for the coronavirus, what would take place is the governor would say, oh, churches need to be closed. Well, by all means, this church does not want to be the cause of that. We want to be as faithful and obedient to God as possible. And one way we can do that is being the best citizens we can be. We are as elders every day listening to the news, going online and double checking what the requirements are. And as of right now, the government's, uh, governor's requirement for the state of New York is 50% occupancy in a room, what it's allowed to have. Quite honestly, this room would be allowed to have over 100 people in it. If God ever brings us to that place where we're that blessed, we'll have to figure it out because that would seem to be too many for me. But right now, we are well spread out. God has given us this as a gymnasium to use. We're not in our sanctuary. And so for those who are online watching, uh, there is 12, 14 feet between each family group. And we are being diligent. And so we are going to continue that. Continue to let the elders know if you hear something that is of substance and we will do our due diligence and confirm that. And uh, as of right now, the governor has said those three areas are what he is pulling back on. But as of right now, uh, in this part of New York State, in this place, Bullville, New York, Circleville, New York, Pinebush, New York, we are allowed to have 50% occupancy and we are far under that. And I thank all of you for wearing your masks and sanitizing your hands. 
Let's continue. On a different note, similar because it has to do with being good citizens, I'm wearing my patriotic tie. Uh, this past week was Veterans Day. And it's a day that we remember that all those who serve in the armed forces, they're on the front lines protecting our freedoms. And again, I pray that you used this week, especially on Wednesday, as a time to say thank you, to say thank you to a serviceman or a servicewoman, to, to contact them. And I find it always interesting when I am at the store where I work and a young man or young lady in uniform going off to either boot camp or, or something like that, they come in the store to get their coffee and when they are thanked for their service, most of them not only respond politely, but they start off being a little bit surprised. And that to me is a very sad thing. It should not be a surprise to them that they are being thanked for their service, thanked for their sacrifice. And so I challenge each of us here in Circleville Church to also be diligent about thanking our servicemen and our service women. It means the world to them. Having a son who's in the military, I know that it means a lot to him when someone says, thank you for your service. And as I said, first they act surprised and then they say, well, thank you for your thanks. You know, it, it, they, they stumble a little bit, but they are ever so grateful. It's been my privilege and honor to, to see often within my own store, people say, I've got his coffee, I've got his sandwich. Well, what a wonderful thing it is to just do that small gesture of gratitude. This Tuesday night is our session meeting. Uh, for those who aren't sure about the word session means, basically it's the elders or the leadership of our church. And so we will be meeting, as we always do, the third Tuesday of the month. Um, we start at 7 o'clock. And as always, we start with what's called open session. An open session is a time where if you would like to stop by and share a, a concern or, or a, an exciting thing that's going on in your life and in the life of our church, uh, an idea, we would love to have you come and join us. And so at 7 o'clock, we, uh, we always set aside some time for, for people to join us. If uh, you're coming, we would love to have you then just shoot us a text Call the church office. Let us know you're coming so we can plan for that. If you would like to uh, not be there in person, but send a note or a letter, uh, that would be fine as well. But every third Tuesday of the month is our session meeting. And that's also when we have an open session in the beginning to hear your concerns and, and also your, your encouragements. This coming Friday night is Kids Club online Facebook. We are doing something a little bit different. Um, uh, we tried for a few months the, the Zoom approach that the school is uh, doing. Pray for the teachers. Pray for the teachers. Zoom was very, very difficult. Um, pray for the teachers. I, I, that, I, I'm going to say that ten more times probably. It was just so amazing to me to realize how difficult our teacher's job is right now. And so what we've tried to do and decided to do is a little bit different. We are going to be doing a live Kids Club Facebook. And that way, if a child can't be there, um, it gets saved and they can access the teaching, the kind of Sunday school growth material later on. If they want to be there and they want to text uh, or message in, they can message each other in and talk with each other as the program's going on. Um, but the Zoom approach, we felt, was, was not something that we were capable of giving it the best job that it can be. And so uh, this Friday night at 7 o'clock is Facebook Live Kids Club. If you have a little one in your house or little ones or, or grandchildren, we encourage you to uh, plug them in and have them participate. Um, this Saturday is Men's Breakfast Bible Study. And technically, this is the last week for... Operation Christmas Child, the, the presents. Next week after church, they are going to be loaded into the vehicles and brought over to the distribution site. So if during this week or next Sunday you still say, wow, I, I know I have some stuff at home, there still is that possibility, but today is technically the last day. We had always hoped that we would have an average of about one package per person attending. Well, guess what? As of this morning, that's what we have. So we've already met what we've done in the past. We still have a week. 
So if the Lord has laid it upon your heart, it is certainly not too late. Are there any other announcements or, or things that I may have neglected to mention? They need to sign up for the Advent Council. Very good. Um, outside in our front entryway, uh, next to the hand sanitizer, there is a bag for the Advent family. Uh, so that is something that we are still planning to do. Please sign up as an Advent family. Something our church has done uh, for many years. It's a, a secret family that's going to reach out to another family within the church. And you kind of pass things back and forth over the course of Advent. And then at the end of the season, when Christmas comes, you find out who your Advent family is and kind of just celebrate together. It's a, it's a fun way to uh, give gifts to one another in an anonymous way to start with and encourage one another. So please uh, sign up uh, as the Advent family. Uh, Thomas and Aaron, since Grandma's not here anymore, you guys are responsible to sign up our family. <laughs> They're giving me this blank look like, wait a second. Anybody else? Cindy? Fantastic. Um, I know that the deacons are working diligently at providing uh, meals, baskets fam for families during the uh, Thanksgiving season. And uh, if you have not had a chance yet to uh, bring either a cash donation or a donation of food, uh, if you could bring it by tomorrow, uh, the deacons will be putting together the baskets. If you go to the fellowship hall, you'll see tables set up already with all kinds of canned goods and food on it and uh, getting ready for that wonderful ministry that our church uh, participates in each year. And so uh, if that's something that you are feel, felt led to do, uh, by tomorrow would be a great time to have the food here or possibly a, a donation to help provide the turkeys or whatever else is going to be in that basket. Anyone else this morning? Let's just pause for uh, a word of prayer before our ministry moment. Father, we thank you for, in a sense, the, the business of the church, something that we just went through, announcements. Lord, we're a family. We are a family, and we need to be on the same page together. And so, Lord, for this opportunity to be one, we ask, dear Lord, that you would pour out your blessings. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In your bulletins, there is something called a ministry moment. The first Sunday of each month, we do what's called a mission moment. And we start off the month with a missionary or a mission project. And that month, uh, we will pray for them diligently each, uh, each week. And this month, we're doing Samaritan's Purse, which is the organization that oversees Operation Christmas Child. The second Sunday of each month is Communion Sunday. And we celebrated communion last Sunday. The third Sunday is ministry moment. And the ministries that's taking place here at this church. And I'd like to turn your attention to the insert. And I'd like to read through it for just a moment. It is a challenge. Each of us are called to be the hands, feet, and voice of Christ to our church, our community, and to the world. Each month on the third Sunday, we focus on a different ministry here at Circleville EPC. From kids club to upward basketball, from the hospital loan equipment closet to the many Bible study opportunities and so much more. This month is an open challenge to find your calling, your niche. Where are you currently and where can you be involved as an instrument of grace here at Circleville? First, pray for the Spirit's leading. Second, be active, seeking out a task. And third, do what you believe God has called you to do. Come talk to the elders or deacons or, or one of our committees for ideas where there are areas of need and opportunity. We have the Fellowship and Special Events Committee, the Christian Education Committee, the Missions Committee, and something that is being put together, building and grounds. Up front or behind the scenes, God has a place for you. And then there's a little joke in there. Don't let yourself become a pew potato. And that's the church version of a couch potato. 
God has called and given each of you gifts. And the real question is, are you using your gifts for his glory? And I know that it's more effective to be asked. I realize that. The elders realize that. The deacons realize that. But asking you to do something, well, it would be better for the Holy Spirit to work in your heart and for you to say, you know what? God has called me. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to ask, but what a wonderful blessing it would be for you to have a pull of the Holy Spirit to do something as hands, feet, and voice of Christ. To close this ministry moment, I'm going to share that it might not even be something we're doing at the moment. Maybe you have a dream, a calling from the Holy Spirit to do something different than our church is already doing. What a wonderful thing that would be to approach uh, the, the elders and say, you know what? I believe that God wants me to do this through our church to reach the community, to, to reach our church better, to, to change the world. And for the elders and for you to pray about it and to see how God can put you to work in the ministry of grace here at Circleville. I remember a while ago being told that as seasons change, ministries change. There was a point in history where there was no such thing as Sunday school. There was a point in history when there was no such thing as vacation Bible school. And at the moment, because of the coronavirus, those things are not happening. But that doesn't mean ministry should not or does not happen. Perhaps God has given you an idea, a way to serve him more faithfully. So my friends, there's a challenge before you. What are you currently doing? And what might the Holy Spirit be calling you to do to be his hands, his feet, and his voice of Christ through Circleville? Thomas, would you come join with me up here? Our call to worship this morning, we read in scripture last week, it came from Psalm 51. And Thomas and I are going to sing for you the, the call to worship. It's creating me a clean heart. It's the words of King David when he realized that he needed to be changed by God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Father, we come before you with a prayer of confession. We know that our sin is ever before you. We know that our brokenness is ever in front of you. And yet, you love us anyway. While we were yet sinners, you chose to love us, to pour out your grace, to send Jesus Christ. Lord, we confess today that there are many things that we do that we ought not do. And Lord, we confess today there are many things that we ought to do 
that we do not do. Father, open our eyes that we might see your will more clearly. Open our ears that we might hear your voice more clearly. Open our hearts that we would desire to be obedient to you more faithfully. Lord, we confess, we confess that apart from you, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Lord, we confess, we confess that there is nothing that we can do apart from you to bring you honor and glory. So empty us of ourselves, dear Lord. Empty us of our desires. Empty us of our hopes and dreams that cloud your will. And instead, may those hopes and dreams that reside within us be your will for our lives. So Lord, we confess on behalf of ourselves but that confession goes far beyond. We confess on behalf of our families, our spouses and children. We confess on behalf of our church, which does not always live up to your standards. We confess on behalf of our communities and our nation. Oh Lord, be with this nation. We say in words, one nation under God, and those words all too often seem to be empty. So Lord, we confess that we are not who we ought to be. And so in that attitude, we ask for the outpouring of your grace to be in abundance because it is only by your grace and by your leading that we find your face, that we find your freedom that we find Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. I'm gonna ask if the young people would come forward and I'm gonna ask that we would stand together as we get ready to sing our songs of praise. The first one will be found on page 531 and we'll be singing that a cappella. They can stand there while you and I leave the first one. The first one is a round that we've done before. And uh, those who are sitting on this side, you guys can sing with me. And those who are sitting over here, you guys can sing with Thomas. Unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, do I lift up my soul, unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, do I lift up my soul, O my God, O my God, I trust in thee, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. That last part we all do together. Yeah, that was my all favorite, right. buddy. <laughs> so we're going to try that again. It was a good practice. This side of the congregation will sing with me, and this side will sing with Thomas. Unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, do I lift up my soul, unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, do I lift up my soul, oh my God, oh my God, I trust in thee, I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. And Ashley and Kelly, would you come join us? 654, hymn number 654. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God.
those of you who have brought your Bibles, we are looking at Daniel chapter 9. And if you're using your pew Bibles, uh, that is found on page 947, page 947. We're going to ask that the Lord give a, a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Father, we ask right now that you would pour out your spirit, for we know that apart from you, our eyes are blind. We know that apart from you, our ears are deaf and our hearts are hearts of stone. So we ask for your spirit that as we read your word, it would be alive, that it would be sharper than any two-edged sword, that it would change us, change things around us. Lord, we ask this for your glory, for your honor, in Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 9, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 23 today. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azarias, by descent, Ami, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldees, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books of the numbers of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Israel, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him in prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession saying, O Lord, 
the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and your rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. As at this day, the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you, to us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed from your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice and the curse and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been pronounced upon us. Because we have sinned against him, he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us great calamity. For under the whole of heaven, there has not been done a thing like that which is done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity that has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned and done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from the city of Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all those around us. Now, therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not. For your own sake, O oh my God, because your city, your people, are called by your name. We're going to stop there at verse 19. For a moment, let's remind ourselves of some background. Daniel. The theme of the book of Daniel is that God is sovereign. That no matter what befalls his people, plenty are what. Treasure or tribulation, joy or judgment, God is still on the throne. The theme of the book of Daniel from the very beginning to the very end is consistent. And Daniel, in the beginning chapters, has historical narrative stories 
histories, real stories, real true stories of Daniel's life and the lives of his friends, how God stepped into their life, and in the midst of trial and tribulation, God was still on the throne. Those first chapters talked about the kings of the day, the great rulers of the empires, Babylon and Persia, and how God, even though these were pagan kings, how even though these nations were pagan nations, God was still calling the shots. God was still on the throne. God is, was, and always will be sovereign. And we looked for a while and realized that Daniel is unique. We don't realize that because it's written in English for us. That the book of Daniel starts off in Hebrew and then is written in Aramaic. The land of the day, the the voice of the day, the language of the day. So that the Babylonians and the Persians would understand it. And then Daniel goes back to Hebrew. And right now we are in the portion of the book of Daniel that was written to God's people. That was not just the Jews then. God's people are God's people today, the church of Jesus Christ. So with ears a little more inclined, I hope you're saying, wow, this is not now just a general proclamation of God's sovereignty to the world. Right now, Daniel is speaking to the church. Daniel is speaking to God's people. Daniel is speaking to you. And Daniel records for us a prayer. Now, the end of chapter 9, we'll look at next week. And you could start praying right now because chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, the, the second half, next week's message, talks all about 77s and all these kind of prophetic things. But today, this is a fun message. Today, as a, as a preacher, for me, it's kind of enjoyable because I don't have to worry about talking about prophecy and maybe getting something wrong and later on being scolded. Today, I get to talk about something that should be near and dear to your heart, to my heart. Prayer. Daniel records for us what it was like for him to pray. How he prayed. We're going to look back at the beginning of what I started reading. We're going to put some things in context. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asherias, a descendant of the Medes, you will remember that The Medes and the Persians became an empire, and they conquered the Babylonians. The Medes and the Persians were one nation, so to speak, but they were two kingdoms that ruled together. Cyrus is the Persian, written in Scripture. Darius is the Mede, written in Scripture. The Chaldeans, by the way, is the area of Babylon. And so this ruler of the Persian Mede Empire was placed in charge of the Chaldeans, the Babylonian portion of the empire. And that kind of makes sense because where was Daniel? Daniel was brought by Nebuchadnezzar out of Israel, out of Judah, and brought into exile to the city of Babylon in the land of the Babylonians. And he learned the Chaldean Culture. He learned the Chaldean way of life, but may, remained faithful to his God. And so this king in his first year, I, Daniel, perceived in the book of numbers of years that according to the word of the prophet Jeremiah, Daniel is doing something while he is in captivity. Daniel, towards the end of his life career, Because we have gone through his life, early in his life being with Nebuchadnezzar, and then later on Belshazzar, and then later on now with Darius. Daniel, as an older man, is engaged in something. He's never too old for something. What is he doing? He's studying God's word. He was reading Jeremiah. 
He was reading God's word. He knew that Jeremiah was a prophet sent by God. And one of the things that he realized as he read Jeremiah was that there was a prophetic statement that the exile would be 70 years. He knew that the exile was coming to a close. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was part of a time of trial and tribulation and exile, and I knew it was coming to a close, my prayer probably be like, Woohoo! God, I praise you. Woohoo! This is great. We're going to win. We're going to go back home. This is great. That is not the tone of Daniel's prayer. Did you hear the tone of Daniel's prayer? Lord, we have sinned against you. Lord, you're awesome and we're not. I would think that, especially as a modern American, if I knew that a time of difficulty was almost over, I would almost go, whew, okay. It's time now to like, whoo, whoo, be excited. And Daniel's heart was a heart of humility. Daniel's heart was a heart of contrition. Daniel's heart was laid before the Lord. Did you hear about him praying with his whole being? Then I turned my face to the Lord, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Those are things that are not very common in the prayer lives of modern Americans. But you know what? There are portions of Christianity that still take that very serious. Perhaps that's not a bad thing. Perhaps we as modern American Christians are so used to what we are used to that we forget what God's people did and what God might still be calling us to do. In the last six months, how many times have you fasted in prayer? That's a real question. I'm not looking for hands to go up and answers, but I want you to, in your own heart and mind right now, well, that's Old Testament stuff. Wait a minute. Did not Jesus tell his disciples that some demons can only be cast out with prayer and fasting? Well, that was Jesus, hardly the Old Testament. But that's not our norm as modern American Presbyterian Reformed type Christians. Now, I'm not talking about having an empty ritual. By no means, Paul would say, by no means. But I am challenging you about praying with your whole being. What was the purpose? What was the idea behind fasting and sackcloth and ashes? Something that we read in scripture, not just in one spot, but all over the place. Well, fasting, let's start with that. We're not talking about for health reasons, I need to lose a few pounds and so I'll, I'll fast. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about changing our hearts and our minds to be more in line with the will of our Father in heaven. We are talking about praying and being in communion with our God in our whole being. So fasting. Yes, fasting is supposed to be I choose not to eat or perhaps I choose not to drink for a while or perhaps I choose not to eat for daylight hours but when night comes, there's all kinds of ways that you can fast. But its purpose, what is its purpose? Its purpose, well, you know as well as I do that if you have a little bit of a hunger pain, it doesn't go away. It is that little aching reminder of something. You see, all too often, we as modern Americans compartmentalize our lives and Lord, I will give you 
Hopefully we actually even do this. Lord, I'll give you 10 minutes in the morning for a good personal devotions, but then I got to get to work. And I'm not so sure I'll have a whole lot of time to think about you. So that 10 minutes, it's just you and me, Lord. That's not Daniel and his relationship with God. And that's not what God calls you and I to have. Fasting would be a situation where there is this ache within you and it reminds you all day long. And that constant reminder is that constant connection that you are connected to your Father in heaven. It is praying with your whole being 100% of the time. Scripture says, pray without ceasing. So Daniel, in fasting, sackcloth. Sackcloth is like burlap. Sackcloth is a very itchy, yucky, something that you would not want against your skin. And think about, again, the idea of fasting or sackcloth. You like can't get away from it. Well, what a wonderful thing it is if you can't get God out of your head. What a wonderful thing it would be if you just can't get God off your brain. Lord, you had my 10 minutes. I got to go to work now. That's not the relationship that God is looking for. God is looking for his child, you, to be connected with him 24-7. That in your lying down and your rising up, that in your walks during the day and your talks during the day. How many of us have a different vocabulary when we're at work? I was raised in a construction family. Different vocabulary at work. Fortunately, my dad took this kind of serious. And my dad's construction company was a little weird. Because when somebody would hit their finger and they would go, ah, my dad would be like, whoa, language like that's not acceptable. Not normal for a construction family. Do you realize that God wants to be with you in a conscious way all day long? Fasting. Physiologically, inside, it draws you, it reminds you, the ache brings you. It's not meant as, well, I'm going to suffer for God. See, Lord, how much I suffer for you. You now owe me. That's not it. If that's what it is, shame on you, shame on me. There is nothing that you or I can do to earn, pay for anything. It is a willing sacrifice. To be more connected to God. Perhaps fasting might be turning off the TV set. Perhaps fasting might be turning off the video games. Or the football. Or anything that is clouding your heart and your mind from that connection with your father. And ashes. Ashes literally... People would take literally dirt, ashes, and put them on themselves. And it wasn't meant for the world to go, ooh, look, that person is so righteous. It was a reminder that this is not the world that I live for. My eyes, my heart, my attitude, my prayer life needs to be focused on the kingdom that is to come. We say at funerals, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And that we were formed from the dust of the earth and back to the dust of the earth, our bodies will go. Praying with ashes, the idea was a reminder, a reminder that, that this is a temporary thing, this world that we live in. But that the eternal God has an eternal place for you to enjoy a bodily resurrected relationship with him, to know him and enjoy him forever. So that's where Daniel starts. Daniel starts off with, with praying in his whole being, not just a 10 minute personal devotion, morning, let's get going, but his whole being was focused intentionally on prayer. And then he says, I prayed to the Lord my God 
and made confession, saying, and here's where the words start, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God. I want you to, for a moment, just stop there. The beginning of his prayer, the beginning of him verbalizing, the beginning of him opening his mouth and speaking to God. O oh Lord, the great and awesome God. If you encounter the character of God, you will be changed. Now, why do I say the character of God? Well, it's not who you want God to be, it's who God is. I could use an example for a moment. You might know somebody or think you know them, and you look at them through the lens of what you believe about them. And so, if you like them, almost anything they say, anything they do, you will kind of have an answer for why it's okay. Well, maybe you don't like somebody. Anything they say or anything they do, you will have an answer or a criticism for what they're doing or they're saying because of what you believe they are, what you believe their character is. My question is, do you know the true character of God found and revealed in his word? Because with human beings, this person right here might look at that young lady and go, oh, she's wonderful, and see how nice she is, and all the things she does. And this person over here would go, see that young lady? She's horrible, and she does this, and she... And it's the same person they're talking about. They both believe something different about the person's character, who they are. Maybe she does something nice. She does the dishes for her elderly mom, and she, she arrives at church, and she... Uh, wants to hand out the bulletins, and this person who likes her says, isn't that wonderful? She's such a caring, loving daughter, and she's caring about people. This person says over there, she wants something. And both people see that same person from two completely different perspectives. We've experienced that, right? Well, who is your God? Because if you have the wrong character image of God in your head, everything else falls apart. Everything else falls apart. Your theology, your approach to God, what you think he's doing, what you think he's not doing, how he's treating you, how he's treating the world, you see things completely different if you don't start with the truth of the character of God. So when Daniel approaches God, he starts off by saying, you are the great and awesome God. And as we read his prayer, he talks about God being right and God being righteous and God alone being worthy. That he is the one who is filled with steadfast love. He is the one who is faithful to the covenant. This is who God is. And when you know who God is, it will change who you are. It will change how you respond. So what does Daniel do? Daniel falls down in confession. When you stand in the presence of a holy, righteous, loving, steadfast, loving God who cares about you but is holy and righteous at the same time, you fall on your face and you cry in confession because you know that you are not worthy. I know that I am not worthy. I know that I have no right to stand before God. Daniel is reading the book of Jeremiah and he's saying, wow, this exile is almost over, but that doesn't change who God is and that doesn't change who I am. All it confirms is that he is worthy and I am not. Daniel is on the brink of a change in what's going on around him, but it doesn't change the character of God and it doesn't change the status of who Daniel is and who God's people are. God is the same in plenty and in want, in treasure and tribulation, 
in joy and in judgment, God's character is still the same. And you and I, when we are in times of joy, times of treasure, times of plenty, we ought to still fall before him and say, forgive me. Forgive me. Thank you, Lord, for, for what you're pouring out. But, Lord, forgive me, because I am not worthy, and I am from a people that's not worthy. So Daniel approaches the character of God, and then he responds to God's character. How do you respond to God's character? Youth group met on Friday night, and we had some games and some pizza, and we looked at this passage a little bit together. And one of the things that we realized is, unfortunately, most of our prayer lives are kind of a list to God as if he was Santa Claus. Lord, here's my, my wish list. Isn't that the case? Where's confession? Where's adoration? Where's thanksgiving? We right away jump to our wish list. Lord, heal this person. That's a good prayer. There's nothing wrong with it. Lord, protect our nation. That's a good prayer. Lord, do this, do this, do this, do this. Lord, this is what I would like. This is what I think. Lord, this would be best. That's not where Daniel starts. And that's not even where Daniel ends. And youth group on Friday night had the conviction that unfortunately our prayer lives as modern evangelical Christians in America are the list that we send off to Santa Claus. God is not Santa. He is the King of Kings. The sovereign, the one who is owed reverence and honor, adoration and exaltation. And so Daniel approaches the true character of God, and then Daniel responds because of that true character of God in confession. If you noticed, Daniel talked about how the kings and the princes and the fathers, his fathers, his forefathers, and all the people of Israel, all the people of Israel. Again, we're not talking about outside God's people right now. This is written in Hebrew. This is written to God's chosen people. This is written to the church. He was talking about how God's people are not listening to God's word. And Daniel keeps saying all and us. You know what? We've been looking at Daniel. Daniel looks to be a pretty good guy, doesn't he? And yet Daniel puts himself in that same passage. Daniel doesn't say, well, Lord, most of the Americans, most of the people in Circleville, most of the people in the church, you know, they're, they got it wrong. Daniel says us. Daniel says all. Daniel says me. Approaches the character of God. He responds to the true character of God. And then he acknowledges something. Do you see at the end of the passage why Daniel says, Lord, please answer this prayer to restore and protect Jerusalem, to restore and protect your people? If you have your Bible still open, looking at verse 16, O Lord, according to your righteousness, let your anger and your wrath turn away from the city of Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins, for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all those who are around us. Now, therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant, to his plea for mercy and for your sake, O oh Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary and then jump down 
to the bottom, second half of verse 19. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. God, help me to be faithful for your glory. Help Circleville Church to be faithful for your glory. Help the United States to get back on the right track for your glory. Not because it's comfortable to me. Not because it'll feel better. Not because I like it. Lord, whatever takes place, it needs to take place for your glory. And so if exile was for your glory, then so be it. If trials and tribulation are for your glory, so be it. If treasure is for your glory, so be it. But Lord, for your glory, right now, your people, dear Lord, your city, Jerusalem, is a byword, a curse word, a laughing stock. Right now, is the church of Jesus Christ a laughing stock? A laughing stock, I'll share with you one idea of how that can be. You say one thing and you do another. Now it's absolutely true. When I call myself a Christian, when we call ourselves Christians, we will automatically become hypocrites. Because if I say that I am a Christian, that I look like Jesus, every time that I fail and fall short, I am a hypocrite. But my friends, what we say about God, what we say about God's word, what we believe God's word tells us to do and to be, are we? And if not, then we are a byword. We're becoming a byword. We're becoming a laughing stock. We are becoming a curse to those around. It breaks my heart when I share the gospel with somebody in Wartsboro who walks into the store and, and I have the opportunity, the door opens up and I start to share a little bit about the faith in Christ and the person's like, oh, you're one of those evangelical Christians? You're a born againer? Ew. And I'm like, why, why do you say that? Well, the evangelical born againers that I've met, they're a bunch of jerks. And they'll describe to me and from their perspective, I have to tell you, yeah, some of us can be pretty jerky. Some of us can put on nice suits and ties on Sunday, but then when we're on the construction site, the foul language comes out of our mouth, and we certainly are not being image bearers of Christ, but on Sunday, boy, do we look good. Or perhaps the church has a, a rally or a ministry or a... Uh, tent revival meeting outside and we invite people and meanwhile those same people have seen us in other areas of life and those other areas of life we have not been image bearers of Christ but we're at this revival tent meeting or we're at, we invite them to something special and they know the whole picture not just the Sunday look my friends, Daniel approached the character of God. And Daniel responded to that true character of God in confession and humility. And then Daniel acknowledged that this was all about God's glory. It was not about restoring Jerusalem. It was not about restoring the temple. It was not about restoring God's people. It was not about having a beautiful building. It was not about having a great piano. It was not about us. It is about the glory of God. And if we get fooled into believing that success is in buildings, success is in programs, success is in perfect music, we have lost the humility that God calls us to have. My friends, prayer. Daniel prays with his whole being. 
in fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel turns his entire attention to being in that intimate presence with a God that desires and requires reverence. I want you to hear that phrase again. Daniel turned his entire attention to the God who requires and desires both intimacy and reverence. There are branches of Christianity right now that Jesus is just this warm fuzzy and God's this warm cuddly teddy bear and you know everything's warm and fuzzy. That's not the God of the Bible. The character, the true character of God. When you enter into that whole being prayer, you will respond in confession, respond in humility, and you will end by acknowledging it is for his glory alone. We're coming to the close of this morning's message. But I want you to hear again from God's word. Now, therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your sake, O Lord, make your face shine upon the sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh my God, incline your ear to hear, open your eyes to see our desolations, the city that has been called by your name, for we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy, your character. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, pay attention and act. Do not delay. For your sake, oh my God, for your sake, because your city, your people are called by your name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus. And Lord, we fail and fall flat in your sovereignty, in your covenant, in your steadfast love, we ask, dear Lord, that you would do whatever it takes to shape us and mold us to be the image bearers that you have called us to be. So Lord, if that means an exile, if that means a tribulation, if that means a trial, if that means judgment, then Lord, we accept that because it's for your glory. We ask that you would give us the wisdom to be the best citizens of this United States that we can be. But never taking our eyes off the truth that we are first and foremost citizens of heaven children of God, adopted heirs of the kingdom, and co-heirs with Christ. So Lord, whether in treasure or tribulation, whether in joy or judgment, we fall before you and acknowledge that you are our hope in a hostile world, and you are the sovereign God of all. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You can ask the young people to come forward as we stand together and sing 640, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
a reminder as we come to our time of tithes and offerings uh, that one, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So if your hearts are there, then give. If your hearts are not, then perhaps this is a time for you not to give. Uh, we're going to be having some special music by Ashley, and so we're going to move the camera. And as that goes, please make sure that the uh, masks are back on so that we can do this in a uh, COVID-careful way.
Please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Father, we ask that you would take these gifts that you have given to us first, that we would turn to you, that the good news of Jesus Christ, the truth of the sovereign God, would go forth from this place, that in the darkness there would be light, in a tasteless world there would be salt and flavor, the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Would you please be seated as we continue in our congregational prayer time. Continue the service in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace with thanksgiving, knowing fully well that you are our God and you sit on the throne. Father God, we come to you this morning with our hearts full of joy because you've given us a new week in front of us. I pray in the name of Jesus that we will continue to see your glory in our lives. Heavenly Father, too often we take your love for granted. But Lord, this morning we want to say glory and honor to your most holy name. We lift our hearts in prayer to you, O oh Heavenly Father. Like Daniel, we know that you alone sits on the throne and that whenever we call upon your name, you will answer our request. Thank you, Lord, for calling us your children. Lord God, there are many in this church this morning who need prayer. And therefore, Heavenly Father, we lift up Chris, Melanie, Scarlett, and Hunter Rotolo to you. Heavenly Father, I bring before you my brother Jim and Cindy Rosa. Lord God, I pray that you continue to bless this family in Jesus' name. They mean a lot to our, to our church family and therefore we always keep them in our prayers. We remember Wayne, Ariel, Hayden and Duke Russell as well. May you continue to bless them in whatever means Lift them up, O oh Heavenly Father. Let them know that they are loved. We continue ongoing prayers for me, Lennon, Frank Gillespie, Linda Abrams, Francine Misolowski, Elena Ogden, Becky and James Kruger, and Pam Mullins. Father God, Help this family overcome whatever situations they are going through in life, especially health-wise. Touch their bodies, O oh Heavenly Father. Let them be healed in Jesus' name. We pray for all those who are sick and shut in the hospitals. I ask you in the name of Jesus that you anoint them with the balm of Gilead. Let them find favor in you, O oh Heavenly Father. Our country is going through health crisis, Lord God. It seems there is no end in this crisis, but Heavenly Father, you alone is our God. May your healing hands dwell upon the world. For all those who have been stricken by this virus, I pray in the name of Jesus 
that they will go through it. Bless our little ones. Bless our little ones who go to school each and every day. May they be protected by, by the blood of Jesus. I ask you, Heavenly Father, at this point, that you listen to the prayers and petitions of your servants now, in Jesus' name. Father, last week we were reminded to pray for the persecuted church. And so, Lord, this week as we, uh, many of us, have stood in the gap in prayer, we lift up still brothers and sisters in Christ who, at peril of their jobs, at peril of their families, at peril of their, their lives, their freedoms, they claim Christ as their Savior. Lord, protect these, these people, protect these brothers and sisters, protect these churches, provide freedom in these countries, provide freedom in these places that right now are hostile to the name of Jesus Christ. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we lift up the life of this church in your, in your hands. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who come here every day to pray and worship you. Father God, just like Joshua said, in, in this house, we will always worship you. We thank you for loving us, for calling us your children, for blessing us with good things in our lives. Yes, Lord, we will never forget your goodness. 
And therefore, I pray that your Holy Spirit will dwell in our hearts, that the world shall see you in front of us wherever we go. This and many more we pray through our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Not because of our works, not because of who we are, but because of what Jesus has done with confidence, we can approach the throne of grace. Take the name of Jesus with you from this place. Would you please stand with me as we sing together hymn number 235. fellowship of the Holy Spirit and in the sovereign hands of your Father in heaven. Confidence is yours because of Christ. Humility is yours because of the character of God. And salvation is ours because of the work done on the cross. Amen. Amen.
I know, they don't do it right, honestly.